Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, our next guest blew the world away with her horrifying nightmare about grief and a top-hatted children's book character by the name of the Babadook. Now she's back with another nightmare. The atrocities, both large and small, committed by white colonizers. In The Nightingale, Jennifer Kent uses the backdrop of Britain's occupation of Tanzania to tell a revenge story about the systemic violence so much of our societies are born from. Let's take a look. Sing a song. It won't for me. I wish I were on yonder hill. We don't want no trouble. That's just the way, isn't it? You don't want trouble, but sometimes trouble wants you. <laughs> Tis there I'd sit and cry my fill. Get me to the soldiers that came by this morning. It's too dangerous. Up north, they kill us. You sure you want to follow him? And every tear will turn a man. They close. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I don't want no trouble. I'll sell my rock, I'll sell my wheel. I'll sell my only spinning wheel. You know what it's like to have a white fella take everything you have, don't you? To buy my love a sword of steel. What's your name again? Claire. I'm not your boy. I'm Mangana, the Blackbird. I wish, I wish, I wish in vain. You white ones go fast, fast, fast. Get nowhere. I go slow. I wish I had my love again. Forget the bird thought she was going to die out there in the forest. She was free. Everybody, please welcome from the Nightingale, Bakerly Ganambar, and director Jennifer Kent. Um, thank you so much for being here, uh, and thank you for making this film that I think is one of the few attempts we ever really get of a storyteller trying to reckon with the sins of the past. Uh, some of which I think some people would call the original sins uh, of the past. Um, you know, after the Babadook, I'd imagine, I wonder if you felt a fair amount of pressure because the Babadook ended up becoming this massive, wild success that I can't imagine you ever dreamed would possibly happen with this little horror movie you made. Yeah, I mean, it, it, initially it wasn't, you know, no one, no one saw it, really, certainly not in Australia. And then it, it sort of took on this second life where, uh, you know, it became this thing that everyone started to know about. And I, I think, you know... I, I don't see it as a pressure, but I was I was offered a lot of things or potential for a lot of things, but then I'm someone who needs to be really pulled into an idea and, and really drawn in. And, and I looked for other things, but this was the, the one that I really wanted to make next. How did this come your way and what was it about it initially that made you really want to do it next? Well, it was more, I mean, I tend to, to sort of feel things in a more general way. So I was really looking at... Uh, the violence in modern society, actually, and seeing how violence is often a, a, the first response to a problem. And I was feeling really sort of heartbroken about that. And I wanted to talk about the, the possibility for, you know, love and compassion and kindness in, in very dark times. And, and it was just through musing on that that Tasmania became... Uh, in the 1820s became the place that I wanted to set it. That sense of love, compassion, and kindness in dark times is, um, and I don't want to spoil anything in the movie, but it is literally almost one moment in the film, and it comes at such a dark period, and it's an incredible performance by you in that scene. Uh, I can't give too many details away because I don't want to ruin anything in the movie, but what was it like? I'm wondering when along the shoot that scene was and what it was like to hold all of that emotion in until that one moment where your character gets to kind of 
gets to break? Oh, well, like, it was pretty um, uh, challenging for everyone, and also myself, like, a, um, a bloke coming from as far as remote in Australia as I come from, uh, with no uh, acting experience or having been to film school, and getting the first uh, lead, my first lead role in a feature film was, uh, it was pretty, yeah, challenging, and um, everything, everything around where we were shooting, it was like, it was just so, um, yeah, it's so challenging, all the mountains. And Your first lead role, were you uh, acting prior to this at all? Uh, uh, no, no, yeah, it was just, it, this <laughs> all came, like, nat natural, really. Like, um, yeah, like, I wasn't, it was so, so shocking that I ended up, because I'm a dancer, I've been dancing my whole life, and um, getting this lead role in a feature film, my first, yeah, it, it was just um, unbelievable. It, mm. it was incredible to mm. see Bakley, his skill as a dancer. Uh, I think, he, you know, he, dancers are natural storytellers anyway. But I've never seen an actor just, you know, after the first day, immediately, I, I'm doing this, I know what this is. But, you know, I think we shot in sequence mm. or we tried to shoot in sequence. But are you talking about the scene in the hut without giving... Yes. Yeah. So I think... You know, Sorry, I was being so cagey yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, spoiler wanna... alert. But um, I think the fact that we shot in sequence, by the time we got there, that that we there was so much for, for, for Baker Lee's character and for Ashley, oh, who plays sequence. Claire, as much as we could. Wow. Yeah, so that when an actor, I feel, when an actor's carrying the whole film and they've also already lived it, it makes it so much easier for them to really open up and express the things that the, the character's feeling. Well, I think especially with a scene like that and maybe with, with an actor who hasn't done, had to do that before, shoot things out of sequence, you do have everything that has happened mm. up until that point going into that hut. Was that a challenging uh, day for you, shooting the scene in the, in the hut with, with the family? The old man and woman. Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Like, um, it was just, like, all the emotions, I have to show an actual emotion and... Jen was so, um, like, she was so supportive and also um, pushy in, in that moment. But, um, yeah, it was just still got the love and respect afterwards and the support. It was just everything was just, like, the first and hard hard to do. But, um, yeah, really, we was all really determined and, you know, just had to go and do it. I mm. mean, it, it felt like a combination of, yeah. of your experience and also Billy's experience, but... Yeah, everyone, the crew, everyone was crying. <laughs> well, it was, um, a, I would imagine, a fairly tough shoot, right? Oh, it was really tough. Because you mean, guys also shot in winter, Yeah, correct? Autumn, winter, yeah. And, mm. I mean, it's, it's alpine wilderness. Yeah. Everyone thinks of Australia as, you know, this sort of uh, beach country or deserts, but they don't think of it as a place like Scotland or Denmark, you know, and it has, Tasmania has that feeling. So it's really brutal and, we, you know, we shot, uh, not near major cities, so we were out in the wilderness, and and yeah, it provides its its own challenges, mm. and we didn't have any um, contingency days, for example. So if we didn't get it, tough luck. Yeah. Was that uh, something that you were kind of looking forward to as a director? Like, I, I, I you have a glint in your eye a little bit, <laughs> where you sort of seem like you were like, uh, oh, we're the, gonna be out in the wilderness. All right, no, yeah, that no, cool. The, the glint doesn't come from the the, the desire to torture my cast or crew. It's well, more yourself. I mean, to no. challenge yourself. Well, it's more that I wanted authenticity. You know, people in this film, the story of this film, uh, people lived this two hundred years ago. I don't mean Claire and Billy, they, they were invented by me, but the world of the film is historically accurate. And so, you know, you don't want to go, oh, I'm feeling a little bit, uh, I don't want to have any discomfort, let's just go and film in Hobart, you know. We wanted to, to make it as real as possible, to, to honour um, those who lost their lives and who suffered over that period. Uh, a lot has been made of the uh, brutality of the, f uh, of the film, which is very direct, very blunt, very purposeful. I'm wondering what made you, uh, as a filmmaker, want to linger on that, especially coming out of something like The Babadook, which is a completely different kind of movie, but a movie that is horror and could lend itself to gruesomeness or brutality, but specifically does not. It's a lot about what you mm -hmm. don't show in The Babadook that is... Yeah, I think... It's interesting. I think in in terms of levels of 
say, explicit violence. I think this film is quite tame mm. compared to, you know, any film that we may see any day of the week. Hobbs um, and Shaw, which is PG-13 and out, right, from, you know. Yeah. Right, you know, there's not heads exploding. There's not um, people being cut in half. There's not uh, these kinds of things happening. But I think what uh, is really, you know, impacting people is the is the it's true violence. So, you know, I I endeavoured to tell the story through Claire and also through Billy's point of view, but mostly through a woman's point of view. And so, you know, violence is abhorrent. It's shocking and it ruins lives. And this was the motivation. This is the approach that I took. And I think that's what is upsetting some people. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it'd be bad if you're traumatised and you come and see it. And then, you know, if you have a history where you shouldn't watch a film like this, perhaps. But... Um, it's interesting because it's not actually... Now that you say that, it is, it is actually not actually gratuitous. No. Because there are moments where there's a specific moment... And where it's not even could, explicit either. Yeah, you there know. is a specific moment where you are just shy of becoming explicit and gratuitous and you cut away. Yeah. And I think of that with the um, with the men that have just been killed and are on the ground and someone wants a souvenir. It, the idea itself is so abhorrent yeah. Yeah. that you recognize that and kind of pull us out of there. I mean, it's an, I don't know which filmmaker, but I remember reading, uh, you know, a filmmaker from decades ago talking about how someone had come up to them and said, how could you show that on screen? How... And he and he was thinking, I didn't show that on screen. Your mind saw it. So, in this film, there are things that are implied that I think our imaginations uh, create the full picture, and that's what's disturbing. I think it's not that. And I haven't endeavoured to, uh, you know, revolt people or deliberately shock. I've I've just told the truth of Australia in 1820s. I, I researched the film for five years, and we had many. Uh, research. Uh, we had many research experts on board as well. So, what made you, after doing research for five years, I would imagine it's incredibly hard to not go broad and tell the whole story. How did you pinpoint a very intimate, small story within this that, to you, felt like also told the macro story as well? Because I, as a filmmaker, I'm drawn to stories with one or two, or you know, a, a small group of people. I, I like the idea of telling a small story to to represent something bigger. Hmm. Uh, it's not something I'm even conscious of doing. I think I, I'm i just drawn to... You never got lost in the weeds of the research? and No, I mean, I never saw, like, big battle scenes. But, you know, <laughs> in a way, I mean, the, cu the culture and the story demanded it to be told like this because, um, you know, we had a, an, an Aboriginal advisor on board from Tasmania, Tasmanian Aboriginal elder, and... He worked with Bakerley and I and with all the, all the cast and crew to educate us on what this war was because it was a war, but it was a war in ones and twos or tens and, you know, they were – people were – Aboriginal people were attacked and, and killed in twos or threes or – so it wasn't uh, these big epic battles. It was played out in a much more subterranean way. But I, I, not having those big battle scenes in a way almost undercuts or um – subverts our notions of what a war movie is and undercuts what we've seen in big for big battle scenes because big battle scenes tend to even with something like saving private ryan which is ostensibly a trying to be an anti-war movie because you have these exciting battle sequences where extras are getting shot you end up having an almost pro-war movie yeah inadvertently it, it's it, the desire for some to 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 put the glory, sneak the glory in there yeah. is is uh, so seductive. It's almost impossible to, and I, I just didn't want to do that. I mean, the film that really uh, shocked me and moved me was uh, an, a Russian film, Come and See, oh, yeah. and well, so so you know that was a territory I, that we wanted to head off into for this. So, uh, and that that's the only truly sort of uh, film for peace in terms of war that I can think of. You know, it's. Um, it's one of the most horrifying movies I've I've yeah. ever seen. Also, one of the most beautifully made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the weird dichotomy yeah, there. Yeah. That one where when it's playing in the city, I'm like, oh, I want to go see that. I don't know if I yeah, want to go yeah. see that movie. Yeah, you have um, to be up for it. I think one of the things, though, when it comes to the violence that people are are talking about, is the sexual violence, which is not gratuitous, but you do not shy away from in any way, whatsoever. What made you want to make sure that those scenes were really felt by the audience? Um, you know, it's a, it's a problem of epidemic proportions in the world and the, the, the go-to approach is to turn away. 
uh, even if it's out of respect or, oh, that's just too much. We should never see those things. Well, I, I agree. We should never see uh, a woman or anyone being abused for titillation. But, you know, as is the case with convict women, they were raped. And it was actually very rare to find a woman who wasn't. So if I was going to go back 200 years and talk about this part of our history, uh, I would have been doing disservice not to include it in Claire's experience. One of the most horrifying parts about Claire's experience is that when it happens early on, you get the sense that the other women around her that she works with know what has happened yeah. and judge and, and dislike her even more for allowing it well, to happen to herself yeah. and for being late to what they expected her to, yeah. you know? I mean, during, it, it was a very strange time, not unlike now. <laughs> That's what I mean. Uh, I mean I'm kind yeah. of, I mean, in, that in judgment that, and shaming is not, well, yeah, has not because, gone away. Because with the convict women, they were seen as worse than the men because a woman was meant to embody purity and grace and, you know, maternal love, etc. For a woman to fall from grace, she must be much worse than any man. And they were called whores and, you know, they were treated like that. And, and they were really you know, tough, damaged women who, I mean, it's, it's like the Aboriginal people, like, uh, they, they are an incredibly, they are survivors, like, in spite of this horrible treatment that has, you know, been inflicted upon them. How did you go about casting the, um, the men who play the British soldiers? I'd imagine that um, it wasn't easy for actors to agree to, to, to yeah. those parts. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I understand it, but I, I think it, it was hard to ca cast this because I think a lot of male male actors want to play the hero just naturally. And so, you know, when we came across Sam and he was so passionate about this role, I, I just can't commend him enough for, for, you know, displaying a really damaged masculinity. And I think it's something that we can look at and go, wow, okay, let's look at this human being because they exist, you know. And also a human being, the character at least, who desperately wants to play and be the hero himself. Yes, yeah. He's a completely damaged human being yeah. filled with demons and torture and sociopathy, but he's so desperate to fulfill the ideal male role that he thinks yeah. he is yeah. destined to he be. Has to, he has to tick all the boxes. And this is why Sam was such a, a beautiful uh, choice to cast because... He's such a warm, loving, um, handsome He's got the hero's, hero. You he's know, got the hero's jawline. Yeah, That's what yeah. He's got. And yeah. he's um, and so then you know, often when you see uh, rape played out in film, amongst other kinds of violence, but you'll see this sort of, you know, ah, oh, they've got you know the big R word on their foreheads. They look horrible. They they're unattractive, and but it's actually not the truth. You know, there are many. Uh, people who look very together and beautiful out there who are incredibly damaged and, and creating more damage as they go through life. So. Well, in some ways you present both sides of that with, with, with Sam and with Damon Harriman, where Damon is kind of the more, right off the beginning, the more uh, stereotypically sadistic villain. Yeah. And we learn like over the course that you kind of subvert that a little bit by introducing Sam and how he plays out, how his violence plays out. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's also very common for uh, violence to play out in groups, you know, so that, that there's, yeah, it's certain types are attracted to each other to enact these kinds of violence and there's different motivation for it with the same result, which is pain and heartbreak. How, uh, Bigley, how did you find out about the movie and how did you meet Jennifer? Did you audition? <laughs> Uh, well, my uh, story is kind of funny. Um, like, it all started up with a Facebook post. So um, one of my Facebook friends, like, tagged me on a post saying, I need an Aboriginal actor with no acting experience. So I, I kind of, like, yeah, I just gave it a try and um, emailed emailed uh, the company. And then next thing you know, they replied. And, uh, yeah, luckily she was um, nearby, nearby island, where she was uh, doing um, auditioning, looking for a Billy role. So um, I had to flew like 40 minutes to where she was. And that's when we did our first auditioning. And um, yeah, she made me had, she made me dance in my first audition. And it was, which is really <laughs> mean to me. It was very hot. We were in a corrugated yeah. you know, iron sort of shed, but. That yeah. Was, yeah, it was pretty, um, it was pretty hectic. The dance um, that we see, similar to the dance that we see in the film or just uh, to see how we can move? Just different, different, yeah. yeah, compared to the ones that I do in Nightingale. 
And uh, yeah, f like a few weeks later, I um, had my second call and next thing you know, a month later, I got the role and I was just so shocked and excited. Like, and um, when I first read the script, like, I felt like I had to get this role. I had to be Billy. Like, it was so important because it's, it's a really important story to tell uh, about the history of Australia. And because, um, um, yeah, not, not many people nowadays in Australia acknowledge the history. And because uh, uh, the history that's depicted in The Nightingale is only just scratching the surface. And um, yeah, like, it's, this is the first and definitely not the last. Mm. What was the uh, hardest part of being an actor when you were doing the movie? Uh, well, just um, like getting out of my comfort zone and uh, like, and also because where we was filming, it was pretty cold. Yeah. And, um, and where I'm from in Australia, it was always hot. And uh, man, it was just scary. But, and also for the rest of the crew, like walking up mountains and all that, carrying um, film equipments. But, and yeah, just getting into that acting uh, character, like, because when I first watched the film in Venice Film Festival, I was just like, wow, is that really Billy or me? Like, I was so tricked. But um, yeah, it was just an amazing experience and just can't wait what the future brings. Really looking forward to it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It was amazing to work with Bakerly and that he had all of this talent and uh, and it was just a matter of retraining very quickly into another medium. And, um, you know, I think uh, it's he's one of one of our country's best and, and I feel so blessed to have worked with him on this. I'm wondering, uh, you know, you referenced Come and See, but one of the things that I liked about The Nightingale a lot was that I actually couldn't find cinematic touchstones. It didn't feel like you were being a sort of stylistically referential filmmaker. Oh, good. <laughs> and that felt... Yeah, I mean, that can be good, and that can, I mean, I love references, but then at the same time, with something like this, there is something that is so clear-cut mm. about of a, for, of a reason as to why not to do that. And I'm wondering yeah. if you were thinking about that when you were going to the movie, if you shut out other movies or other influences. Yeah, it's, fu it's funny you should say that, because I, I didn't find a lot of reference films for this, and it doesn't mean I didn't have references, it's just they weren't film. Um, they were, you know, a lot of painting... Um, and nature itself, and I think um, the Aboriginal people. And so there were other elements that I felt brought, brought the, the style and the tone together that, that didn't come from watching other films. Well, it's also, I think, because so many, most other films, unfortunately, are also sort of born of the same class and the same sort of colonizing <laughs> impulses in a lot of ways. Yeah. And those styles, even our greats, are without, inten not intentionally, are possibly influenced by, or are just by this history. Yeah, I mean, I I don't, I, I was looking for films about war or war films that, that had a female point of view. I mean, there's been ones made by women, but... Um, I, I don't know, maybe, can you think of... I can. Uh, yeah, and so I, I couldn't find um, films to connect with this, but in a way that was incredibly liberating because I just, I had my actors, I had, m I see very, I see the film uh, before it's shot, which, um, but you know, I also had nature to shape the visuals. So if Ruddick, the DP, and I would go into an environment and every environment was chosen to mirror the emotion of Claire or Billy and or both. Um, so if there was a really hard scene, we chose terrain that uh, made the, the, the vision, the, the frame look that way or feel that way. Mm -hmm. So I think that was more at play uh, in, in the creation of the look of it. Uh, and when we talk about that, you know, the aspect ratio, it's not 4-3, right? It's just a little no. bit bigger? What yeah, is it? Yeah, it's Academy, which is 137. So... It's slightly wider than than four by three. And where did that idea? Wh what made you want to shoot it in that Again, ratio? Again, I mean, the, I was looking at paintings. So I was, and they were all in, you know, Caspar David Friedrich or these kind of romantic paintings. They were all in a very similar um, frame, which was very close to as uh, to Academy ratio. And I, I don't know. It was also again the landscape demanded to be seen with the humans in it. So. You know, if Bakerley's in a shot and we're in cinemascope and I want to see him in full, but I also want to see the trees, he's going to be tiny. Right. 
Whereas with this, it's, you know, academy has height and depth and it lets you into the forest in a very interior, sort of feminine way. And, um, yeah, we did tests. We tested other aspect ratios and we just went, no, academy, you know, so... Yeah. We were told we, we would have to do a 16 by 9 version, but no one's ever come looking for it. <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be very costly because there's a lot of stuff I deliberately put in frames. At it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so interesting that you said um, a feminine way because that lends itself to the idea of uh, refer reference and past filmmakers and the lens with which we see history and see the stories that yeah. we tell. Yeah. Were you specifically thinking about, I mean, I know that you're, you're obviously a female filmmaker, but were you thinking about ways to accentuate whatever, however you view yourself as a female filmmaker or what that lens no, is? No, I mean, I never think of my gender when I'm working. I just don't. But I do, I do think of Claire and, of well, what's her experience? Or, you know, Billy, what, what's his experience? And I think the story runs, you know, through her eye, largely through her eyes and through Billy's. So, but I, I don't think... As a woman, yeah, you I don't know. think you could actually get the movie, like finish no, the movie. You could no, still no, board. no, exactly. <laughs> you know, it was only after Venice last year that I've ever been asked, "How does it feel to be a female filmmaker?" Well, fortunately, I didn't ask that question. No. <laughs> <laughs> you might have just got that in response. You Tell know. me, what is the state for women in filmmaking <laughs> right now? It's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a question perfect. from Twitter. It's, how do you feel film contributes to the ongoing struggle and voice of Aboriginal people of Australia living under a post- colonial regime also would you ever like to direct <laughs> such a weird addition to that <laughs> i know who asked this question oh, you some do? of being very cheeky yes very funny there is an there is a there is an aboriginal character oh, okay. in a marvel film and bakerly and i have talked about making it we would really? love yeah we would we're thinking well aren't we ba yeah but we, of course, we, we need Marvel's permission. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I just love the idea of an Aboriginal character uh, in that in the, one of those universes. But so that's why the cheeky question from Josh: um, How do you feel your film contributes to the ongoing struggle? Bakerly, can you answer that? How do you feel that this film helps the ongoing struggle in the voice of the Aboriginal people? Oh well, like yes. Um, it's pretty, pretty, um, still happens back, back in Australia, like ongoing struggles, the, um, the poverty, the incarceration, um, to our people and, um, always the media always portraying Aboriginal people as, uh, alcoholics, drug addicts, but, um, like, what I'd probably say is like, go, go into the communities and get to know get to know the community and the people. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a pretty hard couple of years, like for um, this our story, our history to be told the way it is, like not sugarcoating. And uh, I just love how Jen wrote the script, like it's definitely not sugarcoating anything, like it's being brutally honest. And um, yeah. And I mean, some, sometimes we need to look at that and you know, people can say, why should we look at that? Why should we? Well. Mm. If we can't open our hearts to the to the suffering of other people, people that share our country, we 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 can't. Like, how can we move forward? It's so it's vital. So yeah, like it's um yeah our I, story, our story, and it's we have to acknowledge it as it is. And I think as that a I mean the heartening thing is that Australians who've seen this film, um, you know, a, a lot of them have come to us and said it's 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 a very it's timely. We need to talk about this, you know. And if if our country can provide an example to other countries of reconciliation between w white people and um, First Nations people, then then this film has has you know been very worthwhile. I think. Can I ask? Uh, going back to the beginning of our conversation, what specifically were you thinking about, or were you seeing about how? Violence is the first reaction that really led you to, to this place. Do you remember any of the specific stories or incidents that you were seeing unfold in the world that were oh, really I mean, you were struggling with? Uh, there was, you know, like everything. I mean, I was just, I, I was in a space where, you know, I'd lost family members, so I was grieving. So I was very open and receptive to the bigger picture of what's life all about and what are we actually here for. And so, you know, I feel we're here 
to to develop in love and empathy and and kindness and so I could see empathy uh, I can see it in our world uh, vanishing and I think it's not like isn't that sad I think we need this as human beings to evolve it's not an optional extra it's something vital so everything that was coming from the news I mean you know from terrorism to to gun violence to sexual violence I mean you know the world is is hurting and um and so that was my motivation for talking about it it's not because i want to shock people by this violence i want people to feel um something from it feel the real effects of yeah. systemic violence yeah because yeah. how can we let you know how can we let others suffer when when we're okay it's it's not it's not right you know yeah. so um, i think you have a couple questions from the audience who's a question Hey. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a bit about the casting process part of filmmaking. Do you, like with you, you said that you kind of see the film before it happens, do you have a preconceived notion of what the part will look like or do you wait for the performers to come in and kind of show you what the script needs? I, th I think it can be a mix of, of things. So it can be like maybe I'll think, oh, I, I, I see a dark-haired woman and I see this and that and you know, as I did with, with Claire. But, you know, if, if someone came along that looked different but that embodied all the qualities, then maybe my head would have been turned by them. I think the most important quality for Claire was empathy and warmth and love. And so Ashling, when she came on screen and did a test, apart from being Irish, speaking Gaelic, you know, she was fluent in Gaelic um, and being a trained opera singer... But apart from all those things, her heart was, you know, her the love that she had just emanated naturally was really clear. So, and, you know, with Bakerly too, it's a thing where, I, I don't know, I, I have an idea of a person and then you're, I'm always amazed when this perfect person walks in the door that's even better than... Uh, and, I, and I try and trust my instincts on that. Even if it means, like, fighting uh, financiers... Uh, you know, they say, but we want X in the role because then we can get, you know, this many bums on seats. But I'm quite stubborn. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I want to choose the best people for the film. So, yeah. She's incredible. I think yeah. it's people are mislabeling it as a revenge film in, in a way because there is no revenge that ever comes out of her eyes. It's yeah. always empathy and it's where so much of the ambiguity within her soul is where you can see it, is yeah. in her eyes. Even in her big moment of revenge, you don't see someone enjoying or no, embracing there's, it. No, there's pain there and that's the whole point. I mean, you know, it's being classed as a rape revenge film I, because it's got rape, people, it's got rape in it and it's, it's got people who are feeling the need for vengeance. But it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't follow any of the, the tropes of that film. And, and in fact, if people like those kind of films and they come and see it, they're going to be infinitely disappointed because it provides no catharsis. And in fact, it, you know, it, it, it kicks up this uh, question of why, why, why are you wanting revenge? Like, why are you wanting revenge in that way? Do you really? This is a fantasy. This idea that revenge provides some catharsis is largely a fantasy. Uh, if we look at war or the modern world and the conflicts, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't. So, I, I yeah, it's it's interesting that people rush to label. Well, yeah, that's just kind of the nature of everyone's looking for a category or a, yeah. a means to li with which yeah. to label something. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I laugh because I think the idea of uh, if you like rape revenge films, this isn't one for you. Like maybe we just shouldn't be making films for people who like <laughs> rape revenge <laughs> films. Maybe not. No. Maybe not. Uh, yeah. One more. Hi. Um, I just want to thank you for being so inspiring. I'm a filmmaker myself, and I just, I'm just i so inspired by your work. Um, I was wondering why, why you think storytelling is so important in 2019, especially uh, darker, uh, this like elevated horror genre that's kind of coming mm. out. I, I, I get concerned for cinema. <laughs> that uh, I think we desperately need independent cinema because it is our most current and most influential art form. And it can be other things. It, of course it can be entertaining and, th and that's great. But it, we also need unique stories coming from individual point of views. And so uh, I think that they're incredibly hard to make. 
And you, if you're a filmmaker, I just encourage you to do it in, in spite of all the difficulties because we do. We need varied voices. We need voices from all different sectors, you know. I mean, in this film in particular, it's it's a white story, it's a black story. We made sure that we, we told it as a shared story. Um, it was important to us and we hope, therefore, important to other people. But, yeah, we are in danger, I think, of... Of, of losing unique voices to uh, mass entertainment. Are you a person who distinguishes between, I mean, obviously distinguish between TV and cinema, but as a storyteller yourself, do you feel more akin to cinema and not television? No, not necessarily. I mean, I've, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, writing a, a, a series um, based on a, a, a real woman's life. It's a sci-fi series based... It's called Tip Tree, based on Alice B. Sheldon. She was this incredible sci-fi writer from the, the 60s and 70s who, who pretended to be a man and won all these awards as a man. And for 10 years, everyone was like, this guy really empathises with women and <laughs> incredibly bold storytelling. And then she went, ha ha, you know, that's I fooled I you. Yeah, that's because I am a woman. Um, and so... To me, like, that story is going to be told over two seasons in a series format because it's impossible to tell it right. in two hours or less. Or, um, so I think the, the idea dictates the form. And I think uh, purity of vision can, can play out in any form. And, in fact, TV uh, offers less censorship and a le less uh, burning desire to please every... Of the, you know every human that ever that that lives as quickly as possible too. Yeah, like you can yeah. you can kind of roller coaster in a series a little bit, whereas in an hour and a half, two hour movie, you do have to kind of condense everything. Yeah, and it has to be very succinct. Yeah, so it's it's just they're different forms. It's not that one's you know better or worse. Can I ask? Do you remember? Because uh, I get nostalgic about movies and about yeah. cinema as yeah. well, because it does feel like it is kind of independent cinema and people caring about independent cinema in some ways yeah. feels like it's it's diminishing a little bit. Do you remember the movie that you first saw that made you realize that you loved not just going to the movies but cinema itself and independent-minded yeah. cinema? Yeah, I, I remember seeing um, Blue Velvet and thinking, what? have I just watched? Like, what did I just see? Can I ask, can I say? So, interesting choice talking about, here, talking about the night and Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was funny because as a kid, I saw um, uh, The Elephant Man. Mm -hmm. And so, I, and then, and it was only, you know, when I sort of grew up into adulthood, I realised that The Elephant Man and Blue Velvet were the same filmmaker. And, you know, these things had a huge, I mean, impression on me. Um... And, you know, seeing my... I used to sit down with my mum and watch Hollywood films as a kid and she would, she knew all the actors and you... So that also had a huge impression on me as well. Um, but it's that moment when you saw Blue Velvet and you realise, oh, there is a person behind this thing with yeah. a very clear idea or is exploring something. Yeah, well, firstly, I didn't know how I felt. Of course. And, and I was like... I still don't know how I no. feel when I watch Blue Velvet. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> and so... And that confused me and excited me because I thought, I don't... It's not everything is not spelt out, and um, I want to know more, you know. And um, some things even irritated me or upset me, and and I and that was also inspiring. Um, yeah, um, guys, it's been so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for being Likewise. here, and thank you for making this film, this oh, brilliant, thanks. beautiful, heartbreaking movie. Uh, it you. comes out today in theaters at tomorrow. Tomorrow, excuse yeah, me, yeah. Uh, at IFC Center, it, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's. Um, and it's also uh, in L.A. So it's coming out in L.A. and New York, and then it's rolling out to cinemas across America. It's called The Nightingale. Uh, everybody, please give Jennifer and Bakerly a huge round of applause for being here. Let's Thank hear you. it. Thank you.